You know, I sincerely believe that the Holy Spirit speaks and moves. And just what Joe shared this morning is exactly what I'll be talking about today. But I can't remember telling her that. <laughs> and, and she prayed about it, and, and she shared what I believe is exactly what I'll be sharing with you this morning. It's hot in the desert, especially when you've been there for many days, many weeks, thirsty, hungry, no water, no food, and that's what Jesus, where, where he was, what he did. And then in the time of his hunger, just communing with his father, he sees a light. Come and be close to him. An angel appears to him and asks him three requests. And this is what the Bible says in Matthew 4, verse 3. It says, The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. You might be thinking, Paul, didn't you just say an angel spoke to him? Well, when we read tempter, we picture this in our minds. We picture that Satan came to Jesus in the desert as a, a devil with the horns and the red and the pointy ears and maybe the pitchfork and the tail. And that's what we, how we picture Satan, many of us. But if Satan came like that to us, how many of us would accept that? How many of us would believe it? And so this is the way that Satan loves to portray himself because when we see this cartoonish figure, we believe it's fiction. And it's easy to ignore uh, that we have an enemy. But I believe, friends, that Satan is real. And he is there to deceive. And so, and the Bible talks of Satan before he became Satan, the adversary, the enemy opposed to God. He was Lucifer, a perfect angel in heaven. And that's how I believe that Satan, the tempter, came to Jesus. But let's ignore his appearance. What was his words? And straight away you pick up how, who he is. Notice his words. If you are the Son of God. That very first word, uh, Demas, Satan, because he's bringing doubts. Because just before um, Matthew 4, in chapter 3, there is the baptism of Jesus, where Jesus goes to John the Baptist, who is baptizing at the Jordan River. He is baptized there, and notice what the Bible says. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So just before this, just before uh, Jesus is in the wilderness um, being tempted of the devil, he hears this, This is my Son. And the first words that the tempter says, If you are the Son of God, bringing in doubts about who Jesus was, where he came from, who he was, bringing doubts. That was his purpose. Again, taking away his mask. This is who he really is. And how does Jesus respond? If you have your Bibles, let's open them up together. Let's have a look at Matthew 4. How does Jesus respond? So Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. And I would encourage you, even if you don't have your Bible with you, if you have it on your phone, open it up. It's good to read the Word of God together. We'll spend a bit of time in this. Matthew 4 and verse 4. Notice what Jesus says. He says, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus, in his defense, in his uh, even at attack of this doubt, he quotes Scripture. He speaks against it and he quotes Scripture. 
So then what does the devil do? Does he leave it at that? No. Verse 5 says, Then the devil took him to a holy city and had him stand on the, on the highest point of the temple. And he says, If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. So here in Jerusalem, takes him to the highest temple. And says, throw yourself down. So here, Satan quotes scripture. <laughs> Many, you know, the, 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 the movies that we see, if you hold up a Bible, hold up a cross, uh, a, a demon will run away from you. But Satan knows scripture and he quotes it. And I want to challenge you, do you know it? Are you able to quote it in defense? Because again, Jesus replied, he answered him, it is also written, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So again, he, he, he doesn't argue, he just quotes scripture in response. And here, you know, you see a, what is kind of like a, a contradiction where Satan says, this is what scripture says, but this is why Jesus replies, it is also written. This is the true one. Do not, put, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, once more, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And here, Satan, again, takes that mask completely off and says, this is my true desire, this is what I want. I want, I want worship, if you will worship me. And this, you see, is a, a reflection of Isaiah, what Isaiah prophesied and spoke about Lucifer in heaven. When he said in his heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly. On the uttermost heights of the sacred mountain, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High as a created being he wanted to be in the position of the creator and receive the worship that only belongs to the most high that only belongs to the creator god and so jesus in response says away from me satan for it is written worship the lord your god and serve him only and then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Jesus, after he was tempted, was victorious and began his official ministry, preaching and teaching. And he started with repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. My sermon this morning is called Sealed, Tested, and Victorious. Sealed, Tested, and Victorious. And victorious and you might be thinking pastor paul why are you sharing this story from 2000 years ago what does it mean to us why is it important to us today the bible talks about the last days and especially in the book of Revel revelation it gives us evidence of when the last days are and i believe we are living in those last days and it talks about that god's people will be sealed, tested, and if they are faithful, they will be victorious. And this is why it's so important today. Let's go to Revelation. Revelation 7. Revelation 7 and verses 1 to 3. Have a listen to this. This is, again, I'm praying it's speaking to you this morning. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the tree or on the sea or on, on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power 
to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. So what's this saying? What's this mean? Here it's saying that the servants of God, well, here it's saying that angels are holding back the four winds of heaven. What does this mean? Is it talking about that there's literal angels holding back hurricanes and, and storms? This in, in the Bible, when it talks about winds, it's talking about strife. It's talking about evil. And here it's saying that the, imagine how bad the world would be if God's hand of protection was taken away. Where the Satan and all his evil angels could do whatever he wanted, bringing in suffering and pain and world, another world war and you know just the degradation of human humanity of how it would be with no righteousness no holiness this is what it's talking about and so angels are holding back these winds of strife until the the servants of god are sealed on their foreheads and i want to make it very clear that the bible when it talks about seals, when it talks about marks, especially in the book of Revelation, it's a symbolic book, and so it's not talking about a literal tattoo or a barcode or a microchip or even a vaccine, friends. <laughs> it's, talking about, it's talking about something much more tangible and something much more important. Talk to me. Let, let's have a look at what the Bible says. What is this seal? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22 says, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Okay, giving you a bit of a clue. Are you thinking, what, what, what is the seal? Okay. That's one verse. Let's get another witness. And what it says in Ephesians, again, Paul talks about this seal. What is it? And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal. And he says what the seal is very clearly, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So here, another witness, he says what the seal is, it is the Holy Spirit. Let's go a bit further. Another witness, a third witness. Let's turn to Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29 and 32. Notice... What it says and again paul is very clear about what is this seal do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen and do not grieve the holy spirit of god with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption get rid of all bitterness rage and anger brawling and slander along with every form of malice be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other just as in christ god forgave you so here three witnesses talking about that we are sealed with the holy spirit and maybe you're thinking well what is the holy spirit paul so if this is something new to you i want to explain it very briefly when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, we're not talking about a, a impersonal power such as electricity, where God gives us power. But, you know, we just read a verse that talked about grieving the Holy Spirit. So when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about a person. We're talking about one of the, the, um, the three uh, Godhead, what the Bible talks about the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that the Holy Spirit lives in us, empowers us, strengthens us, convicts us of sin, and gifts us with, with a, a purpose and, and a plan in our lives. How do we receive the Holy Spirit? 
What are the conditions to receiving the Holy Spirit? I just want to share with you two. In Luke 11, verses 9 to 10, it says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, you'll give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So the Bible talks about that we need to ask. And I want to encourage you, as that verse that we just read, ask daily for the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Because it opens. When we ask, it changes us. It helps our hearts, our minds to be opened and focused to what God's will and His plan. But there's another condition to receiving the Holy Spirit, and one that I believe many Christians ignore. In John 14, when talking regarding the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But, if, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. So here Jesus is talking about the need uh, to first and foremost love him, but second, if you love him, the result is you will obey his commandments. You will obey what he commanded. And then the promise is given of the Holy Spirit. And this, when we're talking about this, when we, we can't see the Holy Spirit. Yes, we can see the effects. But there is, a, I believe, a, a visible uh, seal of God as well. And you can see this in the ancient times when they used to have seals. A king... You could see him wearing the crown, etc., and, and his robes, etc. But if you took all that away, he's still king. And kings would have seals where they would seal something, like a letter or a decree or something like that, to say that this is his words, his authority. And so this was found in 2015, a seal for Hezekiah, a king uh, who reigned in 700 BC, thereabouts. And you can see in this seal that it has three specific characteristics. A name, a title, and a territory. And you see there in the bottom there a translation. You see that it is the name Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. The name Hezekiah, title, king, territory, Judah. Very clear. So three uh, characteristics of an ancient seal, of a seal that they used in ancient times. Two weeks ago, I spoke about the necessity of the Sabbath and how the Sabbath is given as a blessing to us, where God, on the seventh day of creation, took the day, the seventh day, blessed it, and made it holy. And this day is designed to not only help us to remember the Creator, but also remember our redemption, that we are saved by grace. And in it, there is the fourth commandment. In the, in the Ten Commandments, in the middle of that, uh, the Ten Commandments, is the fourth commandment regarding the Sabbath, the only one that says remember, and in it you see those three characteristics of God's seal. His name, the Lord your God. His title, creator. His territory, heaven and earth. You might be thinking, Pastor Paul, you're just, you're just making this up. That's a bit of a stretch. Notice what Ezekiel says. It says, Also I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between us, so that they would know that I, the Lord, made them holy. And notice in 20, 19 and 20, I am the Lord your God. Follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Keep my Sabbaths holy, that they may be a sign between us. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. So I believe in the Sabbath, 
It is the visible seal of God to show who are his people, who is faithful, who is true. And again, you see in Revelation, the commandments right there. It's all related, friends. When you dig deeper into the Bible, you see a, a, a thread there, there where it's all connected. But when you just do a, a superficial scanning, you say, Paul, you're just, just making up. You'd have to, this is why we need to spend more time in the Word of God, to dig deeper, to study it, to know it, to live it. Notice what it says in Revelation 12. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. It shows and shares that those who are enemies of the dragon are those who are faithful to God, who keep his commandments and are holding to the testimony of Jesus. So why does this matter? Surely this doesn't matter in, in 2021. Why does this matter? Well, just as Jesus, 2,000 years ago, in the wilderness, he was sealed, he was tested, and he was victorious, so in the last days. We are sealed, we are tested in this regards as well. And we see the mark of the beast. In Revelation chapter 14, it talks about a mark that is given that is in opposition to God's law. And again, when we're talking about a mark, I need to make it very clear, we're not talking about a tattoo or a barcode or a microchip or a vaccine. And I'm, it hurts me when I hear people saying this because this is not what the Bible teaches, friends. This is not what the Bible teaches. We need to understand, first, who is the beast? And I shared a couple of weeks ago that there are 13 identifiers of who the beast is and how there is only one power, one system throughout all human history who it can apply to. And what is this beast's mark of authority? Again, we're not talking about a literal beast. We're talking about a kingdom. We're talking about a power. Notice in regards to this, again, there is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Friends, if we want to avoid the mark of the beast. You don't need to uh, uh, guess. You don't need to worry about microchips or vaccines or, or, or tattoos or barcodes on our foreheads or on our hands. What we need to do is follow the word of God, obey God's commandments, and remain faithful to Jesus. This is what he's called to do. And that after we are tested, this is the beautiful promise. To those who have received the Holy Spirit, who are faithful in keeping his commandments, who have been faithful to um, even in the midst of temptation, to obey God fully. Here is the promise in Revelation 15 and verses 2 to 4. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. They held harps given them by God and sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O God, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. This week, I had a long phone call with one of our members. And this person had gone through tremendous pain over the last two years. And COVID had just uh, exasperated that, had just added to that pain, adding isolation into his life. 
But as we were speaking, he was sharing with me his praise to God. And even through his loss and pain that he was going through, that he had peace, that he had the presence of the Lord in his life. And he said to me, Pastor Paul, we have a tremendous hope that Jesus Christ is coming again soon. We believe that. And when he comes, there will be a world where there will be no more death, no more sickness, no more crying, no more pain. We're looking forward to that. And I'm looking forward that, to that, he said. But, and listen to this, friends. Listen to this. But, tell the people, Pastor Paul, tell the people that's in the future. What matters is the now. Friends, what choices are you making today? What choices are you making every single day of your life? Are you making the good choices of praying for the Holy Spirit every single day of your life that he would transform you and change you into the man or woman that God wants you to be? Are you listening to the voice of Jesus who calls us to repent for the kingdom of heaven is near? Or are you just letting our minds just go where they want, thinking our thoughts, allowing our words to say whatever we want, allowing our actions to lead us deeper and deeper into sin? What choices are you making today? Are you making the choice to say, Lord, no matter what is going to happen in the future, I want to be faithful to you and your commandments today. Is that your choices that you're making? Because it's those little choices that we make day by day that will lead up to those bigger choices. You know, when the things really get difficult. Difficult. Walton, this is one of your favorite verses, my brother. Great peace have they who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. That's what my version says. Walton's version says, and nothing can offend them. Nothing can offend them. Brothers and sisters, friends, I want you to experience the peace that God wants to give to you. That doesn't come in rebellion to God's law. That comes to obedience to God's law. Not because to save us, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. I pray that we would be that people who know the word of God and who are faithful when things really get serious. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for coming this morning and sharing this Sabbath, special Sabbath. Thank you for those who've joined us online today. Friends, I want to pray a blessing on each one of you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you've heard your word, you know your word, you've given us your word, and for this, we thank you. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, that he lives within us, that we are being changed and transformed to be more like Christ through your power of your Holy Spirit every single day. And I pray, do that in us. As that song said, break our hearts for what breaks yours, Lord. For the things in our life that do not please you, the sin that we cling to and hold on to for various reasons, whether it's pride, whether it's just the fleeting satisfaction that it gives us, Father, change our hearts. that we would only do your will because we want to be your people and represent your will, you well, that people can see in us something different. They can see in us that we are your people. So please, bless your church here, every single one. Bless them as we leave, bless us as we leave, but more than that, Lord, as we live in these last days, I pray that, again, you would revive us and awaken us. That before Christ comes, we would be ready. And more than that, there are people in our lives that need to be ready as well. 
They need hope. They need peace. They need your presence. So please, help us to speak to them with words of love, with encouragement. Give us that boldness, that holy boldness that we need, Lord, to do that. But please, bless your people. Guide us and lead us. Help us to be faithful to you. To the very end is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.